Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Hada tonight. We're continuing to provide news and information from across the Muslim Ummah. It's my honor and privilege to be here, our honor and privilege to be here for another live episode. We tonight, uh, on this uh, 26th day of Abdul Hijjah, 1437, are continuing to look at Assyria. This is a subject of great interest to us. If you were with us yesterday, we looked also, we dedicated the entire program yesterday to Syria. We are also going to be doing the same thing today. Again, it's all about Syria in tonight's program. Inshallah, we're scheduled to do this for a third day tomorrow. This is a, a subject of great interest to the hierarchy in the Huda TV organization. The executives have asked us to dedicate this time because they're very deeply concerned about the status of the brothers and sisters who are suffering in Syria. We tonight in our new segment are looking at a number of aspects of this uh, intensification, this uh, uh, military uh, coalition uh, between Syrian regime forces, the various militia, including Iranian ground troops, uh, forces from Iraq uh, that are supporting Assad's regime, Russia's uh, air force, this combined coalition, they're pushing to reclaim the entire city of Aleppo. It's a major uh, operation. We're looking at this. We're looking at uh, going back to revisit uh, this attack on a UN aid convoy that was destroyed in Aleppo last week on Monday. We're also looking at a diplomatic action, a meeting being held between Iranian uh, officials and Turkey officials in the Turkish capital of Ankara. We start tonight uh, with uh, this a closer look at this ground offensive uh, that uh, the Syrian forces and all of the supporting allies have uh, been launching in uh, concert with the intensified air raids in Aleppo. Uh, so this uh, takes us to look specifically at the ground forces, and this comes following several days of uh, intensified and aerial embarkment in the Syrian city of Aleppo. Uh, the Syrian government on Tuesday, they further escalated this campaign to reclaim this divided city uh, by using ground forces. A Tuesday's uh, offensive is being described in the international press as the biggest ground assault against opposition forces in Aleppo since the civil war in Syria started more than five years ago. Yesterday's offensive, it saw pro-regime forces, including regime forces for Syria, militia groups loyal to Assad from Iran, Iraq, and Lebanon, uh, making multiple assaults with armored vehicles and tanks uh, from various uh, access points into the city. Uh, that's according to a commander for the uh, Iraqi Shiite militia that's again fighting in support of Assad. Both the Syrian military and the Syrian uh, Observatory for Human Rights, this is a group that monitors a war on the ground inside Syria, they confirmed that the government forces did achieve some measure of success in Aleppo. However, the opposition have refuted these reports. The escalation indicates a strategic shift. Analysts are saying this is also a very significant shift in Assad's strategy towards reclaiming uh, Aleppo. Previously, their focus had been on aerial assaults with the aim of achieving a surrender by the uh, opposition forces. But now we have a different approach with uh, ground forces, including armored vehicles, attacking from multiple uh, access points, being supported by Russian Air Force. If this strategy is successful, uh, the attacking in this way, it would, be, it would translate into perhaps the greatest victory for Assad's uh, forces uh, since uh, this war started. Uh, the United States government, in terms of the international response to this intensification, the U.S. government is interpreting this major campaign as a sign that both Russia and Syria are giving up on the international peace process uh, that uh, for several months has failed. Uh, and uh, these, uh, in fact, uh, many of the allies of Assad have been now vocalizing with the international press uh, that uh, d diplomatic efforts are not the solution, that military victory is the best option. For example, we go to Saeed Hussein Nasrallah. He is a leader of uh, Hezbollah in, based in Lebanon. 
he echoed this U.S. perspective, saying, quote, that there are no prospects for political solutions, Nasrallah said. He says that the final word is for the battlefield, end quote. Also, another person, uh, allied to Bashar al-Assad, Ali Shamkani, he is Iran, from of, uh, Iran's National Security Council. He said on Tuesday that the fate of Aleppo would be determined only through a forceful confrontation, end quote. Uh, so uh, we have uh, this coalition in support of Assad. They're very serious. They're rallying. They have uh, aligned themselves around this strategy of using military force, casting aside the failed diplomatic efforts. And so there's lots to look forward to as they continue to escalate. Uh, this is a second week now that we've seen this. We would like to continue looking now at some of the uh, attacks that occurred today. Uh, this has to do with two uh, hospitals in Aleppo that have been destroyed by air, the, the air campaign. Uh, now this, of course, is a part, a, lar a part of the larger campaign to reclaim Aleppo. Two hospitals in the eastern part of Aleppo were hit by warplanes just earlier this morning, very early this morning at about 4 a.m. Uh, they struck uh, these hospitals. Medical staff at one of the hospitals told reporters that two health uh, uh, hospital staff were actually killed uh, in the bombing raids uh, in the, the uh, hospitals and that they have now been reduced because of severe damage. They have been rendered unusable. Uh, now, one of uh, the spokespersons, medical staff person, uh, Mohammed Abu Rajab, he is a radiologist that works at Aleppo's M10 hospital. Uh, he told reporters, quote, that the warplanes flew over us and directly started dropping its missiles on the hospital at around 4 a.m. Uh, he, uh, he said that the rubble fell in on top of the patients in it who were being treated in intensive care. Uh, he also said that uh, two patients died be because the airstrikes uh, damaged uh, the equipment that was needed to sustain their lives. Uh, we also heard from uh, uh, Adham Solhul, he uh, is working with an organization called the Syrian American Medical Society. He said that he believes that these facilities are being deliberately targeted. Uh, there are only 30 doctors now, according to our best estimates and our best reports, there are only 30 doctors remaining in eastern Aleppo. One of them spoke with the press and he actually talked very matter-of-factly about his anticipated death because of this campaign. He's an anesthesiologist, Dr. Anwar Shahid. He said, quote, people here now consider themselves dead and are just counting the days. He says, I am lucky if I survive until tonight, but I am sure that I will die. If not today, then tomorrow for sure, end quote. Hospital staff, they describe this morning's attack as a systematic campaign of destruction against doctors and medical facilities uh, in Aleppo. The attack, it reduces the number of functional, functioning uh, hospitals uh, from uh, down to six, and three of the remaining six hospitals in Aleppo, uh, only three of them have the equipment necessary to handle medical emergencies. Uh, now, if you recall, this strategy of targeting medical facilities and medical staff is the same strategy that we saw two years ago in, uh, in the Gaza Strip with the Israeli forces targeting even a UN health facility. Uh, and so uh, it's a part of uh, squeezing the life, creating a condition to force people to surrender, to leave, and uh, reclaim the territory. Uh, so this is highly controversial. The international community, especially Britain and the United States, are describing this as barbaric, as a, a, an ex, uh, example of war crimes, et cetera. We would like, inshallah, to go to our next story. It takes us to an attack on a U United Nations aid convoy that was in Aleppo. It happened last week on Monday, September 19th. And uh, it was a, uh, a major shipment of humanitarian aid uh, to those who are uh, holed up, who are remaining in Aleppo and uh, the, uh, in, the, in the wake of this, immediately after it, both the Russian and the Syrian governments asserted that they did not play a role 
in the strike against this UN aid convoy. To validate its case, a spokesperson for Russia's defense ministry said, quote, that the air forces of Russia and Syria did not conduct any airstrikes against UN aid convoy in the southwestern outskirts of Aleppo, end quote. Also, Sergei Lavrov, Russia's uh, foreign minister, is demanding a thorough investigation into the attack on the aid convoy. In addition, in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, the impact, the, de the damage that was done by this attack, in addition to nearly 20 trucks that were destroyed, that was 20 trucks that were carrying material, but a total of uh, more than 30 vehicles that were a part of this convoy. In addition to these being destroyed, uh, there were at least 20 people who were killed. These include personnel from the International Federation for the Red Cross and the uh, Red Crescent Societies. Uh, now, in addition to this uh, call for an investigation by Sergei Lavrov, by the defense minister saying that Russia and Syria didn't participate and were not conducting operations at the time and place of the attack, they also are saying that they know, they have uh, evidence indicating that a U.S., an armed U.S. drone was in the vicinity at the time of uh, the airstrike. In other words, they are indirectly blaming the United States for destroying the U.N. Uh, aid convoy. Now, uh, we can only uh, speculate what they're saying is that uh, they have people, spotters, perhaps on the ground that are part of the militia that are fighting in, in, on behalf of Assad or that there's some kind of electronic signature that's transmitted from these, uh, from these unmanned aerial vehicles. In any case, they're making a very tall accusation against the U.S. government that they're attacking uh, a, an, aid, uh, an aid convoy destined for Aleppo to relieve the suffering of the people there. So we look forward to seeing what will happen. They're calling for a thorough, Russia is calling for a thorough independent investigation. We look forward to see what will happen with this uh, inshallah, we turn to our next aspect of Syria. Looks at uh, the arena of diplomacy, not between uh, Russia and the United States, but between Iran and Turkey. Turkey is also heavily uh, involved in Syria. They have a major border security operation uh, that's called uh, uh, Operation uh, Euphrates Shield. They are now at least 50 kilometers or just about 50 kilometers inside Syrian territory, that is Turkish ground forces. In any case, we have the uh, Iranian foreign minister, Mr. Mohammad Javad Zarif. Earlier today, he landed in uh, Ankara, the Turkish capital, to meet with Turkish officials. Uh, th this is uh, fairly recent, uh, about six weeks ago, he also had a similar meeting over the subject of uh, Syria. They actually have uh, opposing sides on the subject. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Mr. Zarif, he met uh, with uh, the Turkey's foreign minister, Mevlut Kavosoglu. Uh, this uh, was considered by the press. It was not an announced visit. It was unscheduled. Uh, so there, we can only speculate that this means that there's something of great urgency, that they want to meet face to face to discuss about Syria. Uh, Iran and Turkey, again, as we've said, they stand on opposite sides, at least uh, in public. That's th the positions that they're taking, uh, where uh, uh, Tehran uh, is one of the few uh, al allies, obviously, a very strong ally to Bashar al-Assad. Uh, and so uh, we would like and very, 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 very interested to see what will come out of this meeting uh, that uh, there, there aren't many details. Again, this was an unscheduled visit, so we don't have a lot in terms of content. He is also, Mr. Zarif, is also going to be meeting with the Turkish Prime Minister, uh, Ben Ali Yeldirim. Uh, that's expected also for today, so we'll be looking tomorrow, inshallah, to look at the outcome of this meeting between Iran and Turkey over Syria. We next go to uh, another humanitarian side to the story and the situation in uh, Syria in general, but in uh, Aleppo in particular. This has to do with uh, the United Nations attempting to not only get humanitarian aid inside Aleppo and other parts uh, of, uh, of Syria that need this uh, relief, uh, but also they're recalling for an opening 
of safe evacuation routes for medical emergencies. This is especially important because the hospitals are, are under attack. As of today, at least two of the six remaining hospitals uh, are, have uh, been uh, heavily damaged, if not completely destroyed. And uh, this intensification is creating more casualties, more fatalities. Uh, and so the numbers obviously are going to be increasing. And e as we said earlier, even medical doctors are saying they're expecting to die at any minute. And so the World Health Organization uh, on Tuesday is calling for uh, urging the international community and all actors in Syria to allow sick and wounded people from eastern Aleppo to be granted safe passage to receive medical treatment uh, in other parts uh, outside of the outside of, uh, of, of Aleppo. Uh, so uh, we haven't had an official response yet from Syria, from Russia, from all the parties, uh, but it's very important to coordinate this type of effort because imagine if people are trying to be evacuated for medical emergencies and then end up uh, losing their lives because there wasn't a coordination of their movements. So uh, very important, we look forward to another thing for us to look forward to for tomorrow. We have one more item that we're going to be looking at in our news segment tonight. Uh, it uh, takes us to this Turkish ground and air operation called uh, Operation Euphrates Shield that uh, has brought Turkish ground troops inside uh, Syrian territory. Initially, the initial point in this Turkish ground force. This was a border security operation. They said it was against Daesh. They wanted to clear the presence of Daesh in, uh, on the Syrian side of the border to, pr to protect its own national uh, boundaries. And the initial uh, border town on the Syrian side where they landed was this, Syri this uh, Syrian city of Jadabulis. Now, after reclaiming and clearing Daesh's presence from Jadabulis, Thousands of Syrian uh, nationals are returning to Jarabulis uh, from uh, Turkey uh, because, in other words, because of the success of the Turkish uh, operation. In the official tally uh, in terms of the toll, the number of Syrians who are returning from Turkey back to the Syrian side of the border is put at 3,500 uh, people. Uh, many of them had actually even left prior to the Turkish operation uh, because of the presence of Daesh. Now uh, they have been returned, and we heard from uh, the head of an organization there, a migration office, uh, saying, quote, that uh, our office carries out the registrations of uh, these uh, people uh, who are moving and temporarily uh, immigrating to, t to the Turkish side uh, for safety and security. And now they're going to be going back, at least 3,000, uh, nearly 3,500 of them. So this is something. This is a, a bit of light uh, that we can look at and point to in terms of uh, uh, these nominal Syrian people being able to return to life as close to normal as possible under the circumstances, going back to their hometown in Jarabulis. Uh, inshallah. So uh, this will be the uh, conclusion of tonight's news segment. We, uh, as we said, are going to be continuing with the subject of Syria in our social segment tonight. And just as we did last night, uh, the first part, we're going to be speaking with Professor Imad Mahana, looking at uh, continuing our political analysis of what's happening in Syria and Aleppo in particular. And then following this, Brother Junaid Dar, he's going to be hosting one of our sheikhs, looking at the Islamic perspective of this, uh, this campaign uh, by the forces allied to Bashar al-Assad in Aleppo. We'd like to, inshallah, take a short break and come back to continue with our social segment. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Hara Tonight. We would like, as promised, to continue looking at the subject of Aleppo. We have been invited, uh, joined by our guest this evening, our esteemed professor, Dr. Imad Mahana. Salam alaikum and welcome. Salam. Thanks for having me. Thank you for, for coming back. This is the second uh, day this week you've yes. been with us. Now, I'd like to jump right into our conversation and start with 
a question that I failed to ask you yesterday that I think is important to understand. And I want you to, to rate or judge, you're a professor, I'll be your student, to judge my uh, reasons why I think now is the time that this intensified campaign started. One, I thought that perhaps uh, it uh, has to do with the approaching winter, the season. Yep. That if you've got snow and ice on the ground, you can move troops and equipment, but yep. it's much easier if, it's, if there isn't. Yep. Uh, secondly, uh, the end of the Obama administration, you've talked about this before, yep. it, it creates a vacuum. People can be more bold in, in doing things. Yep. And uh, s uh, thirdly, par uh, Russia just conducted national parliamentary elections yep. uh, just 10 days ago. Yep. Uh, so which of these uh, is, is more <coughs> correct? I think the most important one is the, uh, uh, the Obama administration um, end. Uh, because what this does, it creates even uh, a marketing campaign for the uh, uh, Democrats uh, that they're able to solve uh, problems in the Middle East that is always uh, uh, a region of on fire. Uh, it also creates more confidence of the Americans uh, in the uh, Democrats. And you can say that this is really helping uh, Mrs. Clinton to um, you know, overcome a lot of things that uh, um, uh, Mr. Trump is also offering. Hmm. Uh, so, at the end of every administration, particularly if it goes for t for eight years, mm -hmm. two periods, you always find something happens. Hmm. Uh, uh, Bush uh, did with Iraq, and then uh, before Afghanistan was was uh, uh, in there, uh, there was something in Libya. So they always create something for somebody after them to continue. And here it takes us to what we uh, um, call a long-term uh, uh, foreign policy uh, implemented by United States. Uh, United States is one of the countries that looks at uh, policies as the most important thing that drive um, any uh, events, whether internally or externally. They don't work on coincidence. They always plan, uh, plan things. So if you look at the, even the, middle, the new Middle East, the new Middle East uh, is not new to us, even mm -hmm. though it's in the past five to ten years we've been talking about it, but it, in actual fact it goes back to the 1800s. Um, how the Jews want to have their own uh, Jewish state mm -hmm. and how they can get into the Middle East, because as we know there were other countries uh, uh, also offered, like Argentina or Zambia, but they've always had that intention to get into the Middle East. Mm -hmm. So they always planned in advance. Uh, what they can do to the Arabs to keep them, number one, occupied uh, with uh, uh, problems in their own hands. Number two is create uh, some sort of uh, um, also divide in the world between uh, uh, who is with and who is against. Uh, the issue of Syria is, uh, I think, came quite quickly because the plan wasn't that way. They expected that Egypt is going to collapse in uh, 2011. Um, and, and I think that would help them to get rid of mm. or destroy the Egyptian mm -hmm. and the Syrian army at, at the same, same time. time. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, uh, with the uh, changes taking place in the, on the political um, scene in Egypt, made it very difficult for them to stick to the same plan. Mm -hmm. So they had to hurry and get something uh, going on in the Middle East, and Syria was, was the spot. Um, they mm -hmm. couldn't get into Yemen because it's too messy for them. So why don't you get to Yemen then? If, if you are you know, looking at uh, human rights and uh, um, a peaceful uh, uh, um, transition of, of, uh, of, uh, of a system or a regime. Mm -hmm. But they, they wanted Syria, number one, because Syria is the uh, neighbor of Israel. Uh, number two, um, let's call it uh, Israel owes them the Golan Heights. So they want to keep Syria occupied so they don't get uh, into the Golan Heights. Also, it's on the border of Europe, and, and again, Europeans are participating in that. But again, it, it, because it was <coughs> done in a rush without proper planning, as they always do it, it backfired because it created a lot of refugees. Mm -hmm. And refugees basically aimed for, for Europe. So, but in the end, they gather all of them economically to support refugees as long as their own uh, agenda was implemented. Um, I think the rush to get into Syria made Russia move quite quickly because Syria is regarded not just an alliance, but it's an extension of the uh, Russian national security, uh, just like Iran. 
Um, and the two countries, Iran and Syria, are the, the two arms of, of Russia in the region because, as, as we always say, Russia uh, enjoys being in, in the warm waters of the Middle East because mm -hmm. that's where the resources are, uh, particularly oil and gas. Um, Syria, I think, uh, uh, went quite badly. Uh, after the changes uh, in, in Egypt, uh, Bashar started to basically uh, um, get more and more support uh, from uh, the Arabs framing him as the good guy as we said yesterday and regarding the opposite rebels are Muslim Brotherhood so it's an extension of what happened in Egypt and therefore uh, he became politically very much supported and I think that justifies the absenteeism of the Arab League in the region hmm. because the Arab League is totally non-existent uh, uh, there is no even proper statement that um, condemn that. Mm -hmm. um, so at this point, uh, it, it has become very messy because I think uh, even going out of Syria you know, to the United States is not going to be easy. You can't just pull out after the, the, uh, the, the issue that was created. There is a lot of movements in, in the Middle East at this point. Uh, the Arabs, as we said, very busy. Uh, economically, worldwide is, uh, is not going very well. The region uh, is seeking, or the world is seeking uh, uh, energy resources, and that only exists in the Middle East. So they're trying to get a piece of the cake, you know, or part of that, uh, of that cake. I think, uh, in the end, is that Bashar is playing on uh, play hard to get. And that's exactly what he's doing. He's hitting them very hard. So in the end, it will be some sort of negotiation with Bashar whether uh, you would like to leave the country, please, and uh, let us do something with it. Um, I think Syria economically, on the economic front, it's going to cause major problems for the Arabs rebuilding, uh, rebuilding mm -hmm. Syria. Yeah. And uh, it will never be built. Uh, we've seen that, uh, uh, you know, scenario in Iraq, it was never built. We've seen that in Libya. Uh, so it, it's never going to really change. But in the end, it creates one uh, conclusion, which is the Arabs are basically uh, very much closed on themselves, can't think of any expansion uh, politically, and therefore uh, they will obey whatever orders are given to them. Uh, because you've seen what we've done in Syria, and we can do the same uh, to you as well. Hmm. Orders given by Western governments? By Western governments. And hmm. uh, this is, I think, is going to change hmm. uh, very soon. Uh, my expectation is there is a new generation of youth uh, coming, uh, coming forward with uh, a liberal thinking, uh, um, totally disagreeing. Uh, even to the aid that is giving. So if you look at even the aid given to uh, some countries like Egypt or uh, uh, Syria or Jordan from the UK, um, if you actually analyze the aid, it's not really adding any value because you give the, you, they give you the aid and then they tell you what to do with it. So it doesn't go into agriculture, it doesn't go to hospitals, it doesn't go to anything like that. So in the end, uh, it, it's become you know, uh, useless, absolutely. Uh, so there is a new generation of youth that's coming out, started to understand the conspiracy, is that uh, in simple terms, I create Daesh and then push them to you, and then I give you weapon to fight Daesh, and then I'm supplying both with weapon, and in the end, I'm standing the godfather. So the policy of a good father that has always been implemented in the past 100 years, I think it's going to change because the, the youth of this nation understand uh, how it's going and this is going to change. And this is what you've <coughs> been saying for weeks now, that uh, one of the outcomes of the so-called Arab Spring was that young people learned what yep. it meant to think independently, not yep. to walk with the traditions. That's right. Uh, That's right. Okay, so to answer the question, you think that uh, perhaps the most important reason why now yeah. is because of the U.S. president yeah. about to leave office. Exa exactly, it's because you've got a month or so. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it, it, is, it is very important for him to keep to the party because as, as we always describe it, it's, uh, America runs politics like a big marketing company. You just have to keep a chain, you know, uh, uh, um, one leads to the other. So y what you've seen uh, from Clinton, he has to leave something for Bush, and then Bush leaves it to, uh, um, mm. to Obama, and that's how it goes. And, and this is a continuity of politics, you know, how it, 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 it's not isolated uh, uh, politics. So, and this is the difficulty you find, uh, you know, in most developing countries, if, if not all, 
that the very much isolated uh, uh, politics. Mm -hmm. uh, you get uh, Nasser, for example, he takes a certain type of approach. Um, the Arab nationalism, for example, uh, Sadat plays on something else, uh, uh, like the economic development. Uh, Mubarak played totally on Western alliances, leaving totally the Arab nationalism. So if you had a continuity uh, in politics, would have been in a different situation by now. And this is what you see very good hmm. happening in the Western society, where there is a long-term plan. Mm -hmm. uh, where is it that we, that we uh, uh, want to go? And if you look at 1906, uh, uh, one of the major meetings for the, uh, uh, the establishment of the J uh, Jewish state and the, the new Middle East. So it goes back for a very long time, yet it's going to be implemented now. So they, they plan 100 years in, in advance, but we actually don't plan for tomorrow even. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'd like to look at some of the recent uh, things that have been happening militarily. Uh, as of today, there were two <coughs> hospitals destroyed in Aleppo. Yeah. Uh, that leaves only three that are capable and equipped to handle medical emergencies. Yeah. And then last week, this uh, destruction of this UN aid convoy in Aleppo, uh, there were nearly 20 trucks destroyed. Yeah. And Russia and Syria are saying, we didn't do it. And yeah. in fact, s Russia has taken an extra step and says, we have evidence that a U.S. drone was yeah. in the area and it was armed, and uh, perhaps indicating indirectly that the U.S. did it. Yeah. Uh, That's exactly what happens. It's, a, it's, a, it's under the table politics. And I believe that that U.S. could do it. Because if we actually go back in, 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 in history, uh, September 11 was never done by the Arabs. It was done by the Americans. It's it's a it's a proof in theory, uh, uh, very much to create a, a, a justification that uh, these people are terrorists. Now the fact here is yes, Russia and Syria, the regime, the, the official regime, could be accused of that destroying uh, um, the uh, convoy to prevent it from getting to the rebels, mm -hmm. so they want right. to kill them. Yeah. But I think it's very obvious to be done. Uh, it will create a very obvious message that you did this to kill people, and this is going to aggravate the uh, Western society and the United Nations, particularly uh, on on Bashar. And therefore, I don't think he's 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 going to do it. Even if he's done it, it will be through some other troops, probably from other countries. But I don't think he will do it because it's very obvious to destroy the aid convoy. The convoy, mm. yeah. It, it is very obvious that it could be him, mm. uh, and therefore. Uh, I don't think he's done it. Uh, whoever has done it, even if we don't want to accuse the United States of doing it to, to create some sort of more chaos in the region, uh, is that uh, um, it is somebody that's trying to fuel it up more. Yeah. Uh, uh, keep it going. I Why? See. Because some people are making money. And if you take, leave this example aside and go back to Vietnam, why was John Kennedy assassinated? Because he wanted to stop the war. That's exactly how it works in, in the world. Uh, and I think was Nixon, uh, the, the following, uh, the, the prime minister, the, the uh, vice president, uh, uh, that's how it works. Major uh, powers play on uh, wars, supply weapons to both sides, and in the end, they sit as the godfather and control resources the war is very profitable. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. Mm. So I think, uh, I don't think uh, uh, Bashar would have done it. Uh, Russia wouldn't do it either. Uh, because it's very obvious. Because you can see, obviously, that fingers are pointed at Russia, first of all. So they're not that stupid to do something like this. Mm. Uh, I, I think it's somebody that you wouldn't think of mm -hmm. uh, would do it. Whether Th it's that United has an States. interest in <coughs> keeping it. escalating the tensions and, and uh, making Russia and Syria look bad. Uh, absolutely. Mm. And uh, uh, also, it wouldn't be um, small troops. You know, somebody like, you know, rebels against the rebels mm -hmm. because, you know, satellites and things like that right. will discover them. So, again, it is somebody who's got equipments. A lot of them, too. Exactly. 18 lorries. Exactly. Mm. Uh, it's got equipments, uh, and at the same time, they got the technology and the expertise That's right. to destroy yeah. such uh, a large number of, of uh, these are not rebels. Yeah. You know, yeah. they probably can uh, uh, crash one or two, but not the whole lot. So uh, what you're talking about here is somebody, some troop that, that is basically uh, organized, has a lot of technology, spying technology, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, the route itself, where it's going, that's another point. Ins How did you know that this is the Inside information, yeah. Uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's how I think, because it's always 
uh, comes back to that. Look at all conspiracy in the world. It's always the closest to you is the one that's doing it. Uh, why? Because you need information. So I think uh, by applying the theory of John Kennedy and the theory of September 11, I think the United States would have done it uh, 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 to keep fueling it up and also aggravate the world against Bashar. Mm -hmm. But uh, obviously Bashar wouldn't do it because it's too obvious. It's too obvious. Yeah. Now you just mentioned the war in Vietnam, a highly yeah. controversial war. Yeah. Uh, in this war, one of the things that uh, generated a lot of uh, sentiment against yeah. the war yeah. was this photo, the, the photographs and the videos. Yeah. Uh, f the images that were coming out of Vietnam made the nominal U.S. citizen highly uh, angry and yeah. we had <coughs> monumental civil because rights you're leaders about 240, urging, soldiers, I demonstrating think. to get out of it, such yeah. as Martin Luther King Jr., yeah. uh, Mal Malcolm X. Uh, what do you think about uh, the, the role that photographs and images are going to yeah. have in terms of how is this going to affect? Uh, yes, it's a, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a new approach actually uh, in, in media. It's called the storytelling. Um, and mm -hmm. the storytelling goes in a form of a story or some sort of images uh, following. And that's, uh, this approach is not new, but it's coming out being a good way of delivering the message. Mm -hmm. uh, over hundreds of years, <coughs> excuse me, uh, parents use photos to give stories to the kids. Yeah. You know, if you look at ki you know, children's stories, they're not full of words, but they, they're full of pictures. And you say, you know, here is the line that goes into the, you know, his mother. And so it's all these stories basically deliver a message in less talks and also make it memorable. Yeah, the, the world's earliest writing system used a series of pictures. Exactly. The hieroglyphics. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, pictures are always, uh, uh, you know, they always stick in the mind. And uh, it's exactly the same thing that uh, the, uh, doesn't matter how you write about Vietnam and I think it was 240,000 lost their lives. Uh, um, it wouldn't tell 10% uh, of a picture of what a picture could tell. Uh, and that's exactly the same thing that is uh, uh, happening. And let me tell you that it, the, you know, the, the uh, Jewish people always use that. We always see on TV uh, the Holocaust. Why? Because they want you to picture yourself naked, walking in lines uh, to see how horrible uh, uh, Hitler was. Yeah. Uh, exactly the same thing that the Western society always try to frame it in a way that they want to. Uh, and during September 11th, there was a lot of investigation around the picture that were coming out, particularly from Palestine, because they were picturing people um, in Palestine happy and making celebrations because of September 11th. And it turned out that these pictures are old. So here you're trying to frame some sort of, you know, some group of people that they actually, with the bombing of September of, of the uh, Twin Towers. Mm -hmm. So uh, going back to question, the issue of the image yeah. is always mem memorable and it remains uh, not like words because people, rem you know, forget words or mankind. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. We forget words, mm -hmm. but we don't forget pictures because it always uh, uh, creates some sort of feeling. It as, evokes as a, an emotion. Exactly. Yeah. It, it reminds you mm -hmm. all the way. It's like you see somebody you know, in an accident. Mm. So every time you picture it, the feeling comes back to you. And this is an approach of, of creating a psychological uh, um, uh, sympathy, if you like, with the case, the fight. So they bring, uh, in, in September 11, you know, the two Twin Towers uh, collapse and people on the ground. Uh, in wars, they do the same. So unfortunately, we as Arabs, we couldn't use that. So uh, you do, do you see this being working in favor or against uh, uh, Assad? Uh, no, it's, it's against, definitely. It's mm. against because who is promoting it? Yeah. It's the people that have the technology. But he's generating his own images. Him, exactly. Him with children, uh, participating in exactly. elections. Exactly. But how, how, lo how wide it, it, dis it, it, it goes. The, the, the Western press is not running his stuff. Exactly. They're running They're photos of children. Exactly. Being, yeah. Exactly. So media has become now its third weapon in, in the world. You can drive people uh, to fight with another country just because of an image. But is it going to translate in it into anything concrete, you know, uh, rallying support? to fight Assad. Uh, it, it it's already creating the support because uh, we also need to look at the situations in, in, in Europe 
uh, besides United States. Canada participates, you know, in certain areas. But uh, when it comes to Europe, there's economic problems uh, in Europe. They don't want to get involved in, in, in many cases. We've seen uh, uh, how the, uh, the um, you know, the government in England was uh, accused of certain uh, actions taken wrong or decisions made wrong uh, when it come when in, uh, in Afghanistan or in Iraq. So uh, Europeans are very conservative about war. They don't want it because they've seen and experienced the uh, war in the Second World War. Yeah. But United States was fighting out of their land. That's right. So the Americans, all they saw, the Americans saw was Vietnam. But they didn't see the actual. Uh, it uh, wasn't uh, on the <coughs> the soil, American soil. Exactly. So the Europeans feel that. Yeah. Uh, Europeans see that. Y you've seen uh, Mussolini in Italy. You've seen uh, um, uh, Hitler in, in Germany. You know, with Austria and Germany. You've seen uh, Churchill in, in England. All so of it's all over. was in flames. E exactly. Yeah. So mm. uh, Europeans are very much uh, against war. And mm. they participate uh, only when it leads to economic benefits, aside from England. So England has got a, you know, a, a strong alliance with the United States. Sometimes they participate in things that they don't need. But that's politically. Mm. Uh, but the rest of the countries won't participate unless it's humanitarian, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. like Germany or the Scandinavians, Sweden, uh, Norway. Uh, these are countries that participate for a cause. But for the gain of politics, no, only England uh, following the United States. So uh, uh, what we will see, uh, 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 yes, more and more people hating uh, wars, unfortunately. Do people, the people that hate wars are the ones that make decisions? No. Right. It's the ones that love war Th that's that <laughs> make this and, and profit from it. Uh, pr professor, uh, we'd like to take a look at a report on our subject of Syria and come back to continue with uh, our guest. How delightful you are, and how great is your scent. How magnificent you are, and how great is your sanctity. But by the one in whose hand is the soul of Muhammad, the sanctity of a believer, his wealth, and his blood is greater than the sight of Allah than your sanctity. Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, talking to the Kaaba. If this is the weight of one Muslim, what would the weight be of hundreds? A hundred worlds, and that of a thousand, a thousand worlds? These words a matter of serious contemplation for every Muslim today, as we witness hundreds of thousands of Muslims in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Kashmir, Palestine, Pakistan, Shishnia, Burma, and other Islamic lands being slaughtered, starved, and humiliated. If this is the weight of one Muslim, what would the weight be of hundreds? Recently in Aleppo, hundreds of airstrikes have pummeled the city, home to more than 250,000 people, since the Syrian government, backed by Russia, announced a renewed comprehensive offensive Thursday following the collapse of a short-lived ceasefire. Sunday's death toll marked an increase in casualties. On Sunday, Save the Children warned that approximately half the casualties being treated in eastern Aleppo were children. The Russian forces combined with the continued siege preventing anyone from leaving the area has created one of the worst situations for Syrian children in more than five years of war. <laughs> For this reason, we prescribe for the children of Israel that whoever kills a person, unless it be for manslaughter or for mischief in the land, it is as though he had killed all men. And whoever saves a life, it is as though he had saved the lives of all men. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Uh, <coughs> a very painful but important subject. We appreciate you being bold and courageous to continue with us on the subject of Syria. Uh, we would like to continue with our guest this evening, Dr. Imad Mahana. Uh, doctor, uh, I'd like to ask you about these terms that the United States and Britain are using to describe Syria yeah. and Russia. They're th throwing terms about war crimes charges, that they're barbaric, 
Uh, do you think that these are politicized terms because Russia is virtually doing the same kind of thing? Yeah. It's just... just uh, b before we get to that, I think uh, the, the, the footage is really uh, <coughs> remind me of uh, Prophet's hadith when he said that if two Muslims meet face to face with mm -hmm. their swords, mm -hmm. the killer and the victim are both in the fire. So whether you are a killer or a victim of confrontation uh, uh, in, a, in a fighting confrontation I think uh, it really answers the question so whatever Bashar is doing um, wrong whatever the rebels are doing is also wrong because you're both fighting and in this case uh, if it goes into a chaos like this where civilians are paying the price I think uh, you need to step down and here we're not saying that let Bashar do whatever he want but you looking at the bigger picture uh, and, and looking at the bigger picture wisely and selecting the right peaceful solution, it doesn't mean weakness, but it means wisdom. Uh, so what has been happening at this point is that rebels uh, uh, funded and supported by uh, powers uh, that want to keep this uh, uh, fuming and uh, the, the uh, Syrian regime is also uh, supported. So in the end, we're talking about millions of civilians that fled the country and the country is totally uh, uh, destroyed. Uh, when it comes to terminology, uh, uh, is basically for the use of media, as as we said, is one of the uh, um, uh, you know I, I regarded the second strongest uh, um, weapon in the world, if if not the first, mm -hmm. because you can get people to fight with their own hands by just uh, fuming up an ideology to say you know uh, uh, this is. Uh, this particular, uh, you know, Shia are coming to take the Sunni places, for example, and that can just get people yeah. to, to fight. Um, the ideology is, is something that is good and, and it goes hand in hand with uh, pol political gains. You always have to frame people uh, uh, in the And uh, uh, it goes after the Second World War where we've seen uh, in one of the scenes that uh, uh, you know how did United States get into the war in the Second World War you know framing uh, uh, Japanese as being a terrorist and uh, uh, you know in Pearl Harbor and whether they did it or not so here using a media to create some sort of impression about somebody that you want to attack the same thing uh, uh, you see all over the world you know during Osama bin Laden's uh, um, time even during political gain, you know, uh, um, a candidate would say uh, on the opponent, you know, he's doing this bad, and the other one replies. This is just a media gain and, and for public consumption. But unfortunately, it's very powerful, uh, particularly on, uh, um, you know, peoples that understand that type of terminology. So if you talk about uh, war crimes to uh, people from the Middle East, it makes no sense for them. Well, what is war crimes? You know, if somebody that kills people, okay, fine, we know that. But to the Europeans, it's a bad thing, you know, to be a war crime. Uh, uh, it's something unethical. So the meaning is slightly uh, uh, taken differently in Europe, and therefore it aggravates Europeans to be against Bashar. And I don't think here they're looking for military support. What they're looking for is an economic and political support, where Syria in the end can be isolated and Russia behind it. So it will, through this uh, political uh, uh, terminology, is that they aggravating Europeans to create more sanctions on Russia, because there is already some penalties uh, imposed on Russia. Mm -hmm. And I think that also makes them uh, feel, you know, we're not going to lift these sanctions. We're not going to lift them on Russia because Russia is still doing bad things. So here it creates some sort of differences between Europeans on the Western side and Russia. And that gap between Russia and Europe, Western Europe, is actually for the benefit of the United States. That's divide and rule. Very simple. Because if Russia gets into the European Union, you've got the military and a power on Russian side and you've got the economic and investment on the Western Europe. I think they can be a great competitor to the United States. But, but what does this say <coughs> about European uh, intellectual life and their values if they're willing to say that Russia and Syria are doing unethical war crimes, but they're not willing to acknowledge that the United States is doing the same thing yeah. in Israel, in, in occupied Palestine? Yes. This is, uh, this is again, uh, uh, you know, the right 
or the righteous is not black and white, unfortunately. So uh, uh, you might say this guy is a thief. Yes, he's a thief. Mm -hmm. You didn't lie. But this one is another thief, but you didn't talk about him. So you're giving me just the one that you want to talk about. Mm -hmm. So the fact here is Europeans know very well that what Israel is doing in Palestine is, is illegal. Right. Uh, when it comes to confrontation, is Israel doing the right thing in Palestine? They say no. But when it comes to situations like this, they just don't raise it. It's a different issue, they tell you. So uh, I think what the, 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 the matter or the issue that is affecting Europe at this point is the economic uh, uh, recession. I think Spain, Greece, Portugal uh, are affecting them. The withdrawal of England uh, from the EU is, is uh, uh, really not helping at all. Russia, from uh, another side, is pressurizing Europe through the, the energy resources, particularly the gas. They've got the tap. So here, I think Europe, uh, uh, and, and, and again, we don't want to talk about people on the ground level because they've got nothing to do. Uh, uh, th there's nothing in their hand. We're talking about politicians. And politicians can't sell the ideologies or the intellectual uh, mm. uh, you know, well, uh, belief. Well, another perspective of it is that it's very consistent to this overall 100-year yep. plan yep. that to be quiet about uh, Palestine and U.S. Yep. support of Israel but at the same time, uh, the destruction of Syria works towards that same overall objective. Yes, but, but the, the issue of Palestine is slightly uh, different because um, Europe had the hand in there. Uh, most of the great meetings or the large meetings were in England. Uh, so Europe had a really a, a, a great involvement uh, in the uh, occupation right, of, right. of Palestine. Right, right, and that's what I'm they saying. They are guilty. That, that both <coughs> Uh, a destroyed Syria and an occupied yep. Palestine work towards the same new Middle East plan. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, and that's what we were talking about. It's a long-term plan, but just uh, uh, bits and pieces, stepping stone. You know, uh, break Iraq and then isolate Iran. Then Iran becomes uh, uh, an alliance to the superpowers. And then use Iran to get into Yemen. And then Iran feeds into Hezbollah and Lebanon. And then Hezbollah fights uh, basically with Israel. So you've got Iran feeding into Hezbollah, Lebanon, uh, uh, the Shia side, and the uh, Bashar. Now, the f near future, we'll see a turn around where Iran will pay the price because they're just isolating them for now because they cannot handle two powers at the same time. So they want now the time for the Arabs. And unfortunately, here it becomes again uh, uh, the difficulty uh, 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 or being a naive as, as some of the leaders uh, think and, and we talked about that before saying nobody's your friend mm -hmm, right. uh, uh, because people are saying in the Middle East you know Russians are our friend now because you know they coming in giving us aid and yeah. giving us investment mm -hmm. nobody's your friend mm -hmm. he's just taken them for a time until uh, the as first assignment is done and then he's going to turn against you so the fact here is uh, Russia is supporting Syria he doesn't care about Bashar. Putin doesn't care about Syria. It's a fact. You guys are Muslims. He's not Muslim. He's not going to care. But why is he doing it? Because he doesn't want to stay naked in front of the NATO forces. So Syria is an extension to his national security. It's a front. Mm. So if that f wall falls, mm -hmm. they're going to get to him. The buffer is gone. Exactly. Mm. So the same thing he's done in Georgia. Why did he get into Georgia? Because he knew that there's some, some sort of link between the United States and Georgia. Why, is he, why did he get into the uh, Ukraine? U Crimea. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, exactly the same thing. There's a connection with the United States. So he's got to keep that zone mm -hmm. uh, 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 safe. And this is what we talk about the Arab national security. And in one of the episodes, we talked about the four exits that we can block the entire uh, Middle East, nobody's in or out. And this, I've this got was, Gibraltar. This I've has got to be your last comment. Go ahead and yeah. finish this up. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we've got the Gibraltar on, on, on Morocco, so yeah. I can close uh, Middle East uh, uh, Mediterranean Sea mm -hmm. into the Atlantic. I've got uh, uh, Aden. I can close between Red Sea and uh, the, the, um, the Pacific. And then we've got Hormuz on the Ga Arab Gulf, and we've got Suez Canal, and we've got the Dead Sea. So I can block the entire Middle East, but that, if we have a long-term plan to protect the Arab national security, we could do that. Mm, mm. But there first has to be a military. Uh, not really. Mm. We need cultured people that understand where we're going, 
people that are educated lead the country with plans, long-term plans, mm. have people understand that first, and mm. you can do that afterwards. Okay. All right. Thank you so much again, Professor, for being with us. This will conclude the first part of our social segment, looking at uh, Syria. We will continue from a different perspective. After a short break, Brother Janae Dar is hosting one of our sheikhs here to continue looking at this from a humanitarian Islamic perspective, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome, dear viewers, to our live program. Huda tonight joining us here in segment number three. Now, dear viewers, as you have been seeing over the last day and today as well, we have a very special program talking about a very important subject, and that is of Syria. You can see on social media, you can see on your news outlets that Syria is being bombarded once again. The bombardment has intensified, killing lots of women, children and innocent people and it's time that we come out and speak about this uh, in a very frank manner and inshallah ta'ala that is the objective of our program today not just that but over the last few days as you've been seeing on your screens the militia of Bashar al-Assad has been responsible for the killing the destruction of hospitals which consist of casualties innocent people once again at the face of his brutality my dear brothers and sisters some reports suggest that the death toll um, has risen up to 450,000 uh, civilians and reports suggest that most of those are women and children. The city of Aleppo is being sieged. The people are not uh, able to get uh, access to food and drinking water. So we really need to speak about the subject in an open and frank manner. And we want you to join us in this discussion. We want you to pick up your phones and to speak to us, express to us your feelings, your pain, what it is that you're feeling. We want to hear it here live in the studio. If you can't get to your phones, then please go onto Facebook and drop a comment on our page, Huda TV, and inshallah ta'ala, I'll try my best uh, to read those comments out here live in the studio. So let's begin by introducing our guest, and then we'll go straight into our discussion. If I can begin by introducing our respected uh, Sheikh uh, Karim Abu Zaid, who is the Imam of Dar al-Tawheed in the States, and you work very closely with us here on Huda TV. We've done a number of programs together as well. Uh, Sheikh, I'd like to give you a warm welcome and say assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Jazakumullahu khairan, Brother Junaid, and it's always a pleasure to be on Huda TV and uh, with you in particular. Jazakallah khair. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Sheikh, I want to go straight into the subject as it is very important. Um, firstly, I would like to ask you, how are your feelings and your responses when you see uh, what is going on in Syria, the tragedy, the catastrophe, or the massacre that's taking place? Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah, wahdahu la sharika lah, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. Uh, first of all, uh, it's extremely uh, sad uh, to see that the blood of Muslims uh, is uh, without uh, any concern. Uh, by the forces of this world. Okay. When a non-Muslim is killed, one person, uh, you hear the uh, all the media outlets, and you know they they cover the the news and they address it. But yet we hear sometimes 150, 200, 300 a day, and you mention some of them are hospitals, but no one dare uh, you know care uh, about even bringing this up. Uh, this is really the, the sad piece. Um, the comparison between the coverage, just one non-Muslim being killed somewhere, and dozens of Muslims being killed, just that. Sure. The other sad piece is the passiveness of Muslims. OK. Um, Muslims. Uh, are not even caring about their brothers and sisters in, in, in Syria and, and what they are going through, uh, except the few who are offering their hand, you know, their help. 
Um, but actually, in, the, in, in some cases, we actually hear people condemning the Syrians. Okay. Some states, actually, uh, the, and their media outlet, they speak bad about the Syrians, as if the Syrians are the criminals, uh, and those who are bombing them and killing them are the uh, victims. Uh, all of this is, is really saddening to any Muslim who has uh, you know, some leftover faith sure. in the heart. Uh, sure. uh, because the sanctity uh, of the human life, uh, we know it's one of the uh, higher objectives. Uh, actually, uh, it, it, it is number two after the preservation of uh, one's faith, uh, okay. uh, one's religion. Uh, okay. uh, we know that the, uh, the holistic aims or the objectives of our religion, of our uh, uh, law in Islam, uh, is the preservation of the religion. Number two, the preservation of the human life. Uh, Sheikh, that's quite surprising because uh, when we listen to the West, uh, Western media outlets, they will s put or address Islam as if it's a bloodthirsty religion and has no respect for human life. But here you are saying the opposite, that Islam actually uh, I it gives the human life the utmost respect. I just mentioned two of the holistic aims. Uh, there are five of them. Okay. But look at this. Even though they mark the religion to be number one, that you're after preserving your deen. You're after preserving your deen because this is why you were created. Sure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created jinn kind, mankind, but to worship. So the main purpose of you and me is to worship. So your goal, your utmost goal, your number one objective is the preservation of your deen. The, some of the scholars actually, we have a debate that they said the life comes first. Okay. How? In some cases, we know that if your life is threatened because of your religion, you are allowed to conceal your religion. Sure. As long as you still believe in, the, in your heart. And the story of Ammar ibn Yasser is known. When Ammar came to the Prophet wasallam. And he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, the disbelievers arrested me and they forced me to speak bad about you and Allah, about Islam. Sure. And for me to flee, to run away from their punishment, their oppression, I had to give them what they requested me to give. Basically, he spoke bad about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Jibreel Alayhi Salam came with the verse in Surah al -Nahl, مَنْ كَفَرَ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِهِ إِلَّا مَنْ أُكْرِهَ وَقَلْبُهُ مُطْمَئِنٌ بِالْإِيمَانِ وَلَكِنْ مَنْ شَرَحَ بِالْكُفْرِ صدرة. The essence of the verse, as long as you have the deen in your heart, even if you articulate something bad about the religion, sure. to save your life, you're allowed to do this. And that's why they debate it. So Islam absolutely not, is not about... Uh, listen, the only time in Islam you're allowed to kill another human being is in self-defense sure you're defending your life your own life your wealth man mata duna ahlihi your family huh man mata duna ahlihi wa mali fa huwa shaheed the other time is when you kill a combatant sure you're somebody who is fighting you in a declared war but absolutely islam is not a bloodthirsty religion and these are just misconceptions about Islam, and we know it, okay. you know, and uh, we know it. But uh, what, what can we do? But we, uh, we do our best to correct these misconceptions. Sure. Also, Sheikh, you've, you've addressed the issue uh, of Islam preserving human life. Uh, but also, the is Islam also talks about not spreading corruption in the, uh, on the land, in the earth, as Allah says in numerous places in the Quran. Absolutely. But is this not uh, corruption in the land, what is taking place in Syria? You see what is happening in Syria, I mean, uh, uh, applying uh, uh, the principles of the Sharia on what's happening in Syria. We do have fighting factions in Syria, whether the, 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 the Ahl al-Sunnah, the, the people of the Sunnah, the followers of the Sunnah. Uh, uh, and uh, we do have the Shia. And we simply have the, these uh, imperial 
uh, uh, powers getting involved, whether the United States of America uh, and Russia. Uh, uh, so uh, the, the, my concern and the concern of any Muslim right now that you go and bomb women and children and hospitals sure. in order to uh, uh, fight your enemy. You're supposed to fight. If there is somebody who is fighting you out there, you, you, you just keep that battle with that person. Sure. But women and children uh, of Syria are not targets uh, of your uh, 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 warfare, basically, your airplanes, your bombs. And this is what the Assad regime is doing, and this is what Russia is doing. And this is what Hizb, I, I hate to say the word because they don't really, uh, uh, I don't call them Hezbollah. You know, uh, it is amazing Th this battle in Syria has uh, certainly uh, uh, unveiled uh, uh, this, this party or this group uh, because a lot of Muslims were deceived, far deceived, sure. uh, when they were uh, uh, engaged in, in, in fights with Israel at, at, at uh, a certain uh, time, maybe five, six years ago. Uh, actually, some people would, 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 would actually support them. But now they understand that uh, uh, Shia, uh, that particular sect, uh, uh, the extreme Shia, like that Hizb, uh, uh, Lat, I call them, because okay. they have nothing to do with Hezbollah at all. And of course, the Iran and, and the mercenary, the people. So uh, what I'm trying to say, Brother Junaid here, uh, you see, we understand that there are uh, Sunni fighting forces in Syria. Sure. They need to keep that battle with them, not to go and bomb hospitals, not to go and bomb homes. We're seeing footage of children being taken from under the wreckage of a building. Why in the world do you go and bomb a building in order to fight uh, someone with a machine gun somewhere else? This is what we're talking about. Sure. And even in a declared battle in Islam, the Prophet Sallallahu used to command the leader of this army not to kill a woman, not to kill a child, not to kill a monk, who is uh, somewhere in his sanctuary, not to cut, cut a tree uh, without uh, the need for that. If they are not using these trees to, to, to shoot you, don't, don't, don't kill a cow, an animal. You see, uh, you only fight those who fight in the cause of Allah, those who fight you. Yeah, this is what, this is really okay. the painful piece and this is what is happening in Syria. And it's very sad because the world is keeping a deaf ear, um, a, a blind eye uh, uh, about it. And they are waiting until these poor uh, uh, Syrian children, poor uh, Syrian elders and women are finished off. And then, you know, you hardly get a word out there. And this is the sad uh, piece. And this is the, the top. Uh, line of corruption that we have to talk about. Okay, Sheikh, uh, we'll come to our f next question in just a moment, but I'd like to address the viewers here. Dear viewers, do pick up your phones and do call us. You will see our numbers running across the screen right about there. You've got two numbers. Do call us, engage with us in the program. Tell us about your thoughts and your comments. How do you feel when you see these images on the screens of young women, young children, babies being killed for no reason? So do call us. You've got two numbers there. And if you're calling outside of Egypt, don't forget to use the code. If you can't get to your phone, then do go to Facebook, inshallah ta'ala. I have it open in front of me, and I will read out your comments uh, very soon. Uh, Sheikh, I want to have a look now. We've talked about double standards, and you've clearly highlighted how the Western world, if somebody is uh, killed, how media outlets all take it out of proportion, and rightly so, if he's killed unjustly. But why is there this silence on Muslim life? Like the, the hospital that was just destroyed just a couple of days ago, it is reported that 96 children were actually killed, and that wasn't reported on any media outlet. Why do we have such a massive bias or two-facedness from the from these media outlets you see uh, what is happening in Syria is very interesting uh, you simply have a potential of a Sunni Muslim governing state replacing Assad okay 
you're getting that. Right. The West is afraid of that, and the countries which are surrounding Syria, they are afraid of the establishment of such a state. Okay. Because who's fighting in Syria to, to, to liberate you know, Syria from the Assad regime? So, so the unification of Sunni Muslims is yes. what they're afraid of? Uh, let me put it this way. Okay. You know, and I'm going to be blunt with you. There is a scheme out there to finish off as many Sunni Muslims as possible. SubhanAllah. In the face of this earth. SubhanAllah. Very sad. And there is unspoken agreement between Shia and the West mm. to execute the job. Let me put it this way. Okay. And this is what's happening. Okay. Now, uh, we do have major Sunni states surrounding Syria. But these Sunni states are ruled by um, secular or army generals. Right. The existence of a Muslim state right there in Syria would be a threat to, to their power and authority. And that's why they are making sure that their state media are not addressing the situation the way that we're addressing it. So, Sheikh, wh what you're effectively saying is that even some of the Sunni regimes are actually complicit in the killing and the activities that are taking place. In, in because Aleppo. they are afraid of the establishment of a Sunni governing uh, 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 state in Syria. Sure. Because this is the potential replacement for the Assad regime. Okay. These Mujahideen, you know, the, 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 the it's called the Jaish al hurd or the Free Army. Sure. They are the automatic replacement for the Assad regime. First of all, the West see this a threat to themselves and the states surrounding Syria, uh, without naming anybody, so we don't get in trouble, huh? they are afraid of such a regime. To, 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 to come into uh, the world because it will threaten their authority. Okay. And this is why there is a scheme out there to finish this off. Okay. But uh, I always uh, uh, have full trust in this uh, beautiful verse, وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ اللَّهِ They blot. We don't blot. Allah said, D don't worry about blotting. I'll take care of the blotting. Sure. And Allah will blot. You see, uh, uh, Allah will take care of the situation. And Allah will address the situation. Sure. His way. Uh, and I'm telling you, what is happening in this part of the world is so miraculous uh, uh, in a way uh, because uh, it's sending clear messages to us who are the enemies, who are the friends of Islam and Muslims? It's almost like as if Allah is doing a, a purification process between those who really and truly love Allah and those who are truly against Him. You, you can, you, only blind people will not be able to see the picture clear. Sure. The picture is crystal clear and day after day is getting clearer and clearer. Uh, but you know, uh, subhanallah, Allah will take care of the situation. Because we believe in the qadr, we believe in the divine destiny. Sure. Nothing happens, Brother Junaid, without Allah's will. Okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills or willed for this to happen. Sure. For a wisdom, inshallah. Okay. Sheikh, I want to talk about some, some uh, other sensitive matters which need to be addressed. Uh, you talked about you know, you're, you're, you're getting me into these sensitive issues. I, I thought we were going to talk about the sanctity of the human life and, and just <laughs> it's nothing it. that sensitive. All right. But uh, you talked about the failure or on behalf of some of the leaders in some of the surrounding countries. Uh, but some people will also say that uh, we as Muslims, just common Muslims, we are also to blame because we don't have uh, a link or we don't do anything active to support the people of Syria. W would you share uh, that sentiment? Absolutely. But uh, there is uh, multiple ways where you can help the people of Syria. Sure. Um, of course, you know, uh, first of all, your dua. Okay. Where is the dua? Uh, I'm going to look at the camera right now and ask the viewers, when was the last time you made dua for the people of Syria? When? In your sujood. Have you ever remembered these children and women? In Dua is the weapon 
of the believer, sure. Brother Junaid. Where is your dua? Uh, number two, you got social media. Okay. Instead of spreading comments that pointless, has no value whatsoever, why don't you promote you know, what's happening and, and, and get the words out? Get the word out about what's happening in Syria. So we should raise awareness we through social media? Raise awareness in social media. Uh, a lot of the young men, Muslim young men, youth now, they spend tremendous amount of time online, Facebooking or whatever they are doing. Uh, they can go ahead and, 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 and spread this out, uh, you know, let the word go out. Of course, if you're able to help financially, help the refugees, help the Muslim, help the children, of Syria, the women of children of, ch of Syria, and so okay, forth. Okay, Sheikh, I'm going to have to ask you to just hold your thought for a moment. We've got a phone call coming in from all the way from Romania. We have Brother Mario from Romania. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, good evening. Good evening. If I could ask you to l talk to me via the phone and just switch your television off for a second. Go yeah, ahead, give us your question or your comments, please. Uh, my question? Sure. My question is uh, about Syria, having uh, a lot of friends uh, from Syria actually, and uh, they are giving me the stories about what is happening there. Uh, yes, there is, uh, let's say, uh, Russia which is uh, supporting the Assad, and we have the Americans which they are supporting the Free Army. And actually, in the middle of this uh, leaders, we can call it, we have the uh, mothers and the children which they have to suffer, and uh, all the people uh, of uh, this country, we can say. Yes, go ahead, Brother Mario. I don't know. This uh, is going on from uh, the last five years, we can say, and uh, we don't see any change. There was uh, last week a week of uh, break, we can call it. Then uh, today uh, there was bombing in Aleppo, one of the biggest two hospitals uh, functional anymore, starting from today. Every day there are uh, more bad stories about this country. Uh, brother, where, uh, where sure. brother Mario, when you, when you see these images, how does it make you feel? Uh, very sad. <laughs> very sure. sad. Uh, uh, actually, I, I didn't see never this kind of things in my life after I arrived in Egypt, because I'm living in Egypt now. Okay, okay. And uh, this actually, they are very deeply sad for me to see it, and uh, still I can't understand why all this they have to go on and sure uh, sure thank you very much yes, uh, uh, yes brother mario all right thank you very much brother mario calling us uh, from egypt but you're originally from romania as i understand thank you very much for sharing with us your sentiments your feelings and your emotions uh, Sheikh, it's, it's very powerful what is taking place in, in Syria. People from around the world, Muslim or non-Muslim, are sympathizing uh, with what is taking place. Um, the injustice is just too much, Sheikh. What, what can we say? Well, the, the one thing that I can tell Brother Mar Mario and, and the rest of the viewers uh, who are feeling the heaviness of the heart, you know, uh, it's very sad that you're sitting out there and, and seeing um, women and children being uh, simply uh, slaughtered with nothing that you can do except, you know, the few uh, uh, points that I made right before the call, you know, making dua, maybe use social media, raise awareness. Sure. Uh, or, or, uh, but, you know, I just want to tell the brothers and the sisters who are having that heaviness of the heart that rest assured that these individuals who are the cause of this, uh, they will receive their punishment. Okay. If not in this world, in the hereafter. And I'll just share with them a couple of a hadith. Sure, please. Abdullah ibn Abbas, fi sunan al-imam al-nasai, he was asked uh, whether uh, the killer, the one who intentionally uh, kills another person, 
uh, have a chance for repentance. Abdullah ibn Abbas got so upset, like we say in English, got so livid. Okay. He reacted in such a manner. And he said, Thakalathu ummu. Basically, an expression which means, may his mother lose him. Okay. Look at this scene. يأتي المقتول يوم القيامة The person who was killed in the day of judgment will come يحمل رأسه بين يديه carrying his head on his hand with the other hand يجر قاتله he's dragging his killer the veins of his neck are pouring blood and he will go and stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he will say, Ya Rabb, O oh Allah, ask him why he killed me, why he took my life. For imagine such a scene, a person who kills have to go through this. For, uh, uh, these individuals, uh, when asma Bintu Abi Bakr radiallahu anha learned that her son Abdullah ibn Zubair was killed by uh, the famous uh, you know uh, Iraqi uh, guy uh, he asked her did you see what I did to your son you know he killed Abdullah ibn Zubair and he hanged him on a, a cross okay you know what she said to him? Yes, I saw. Al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, his name. Yes, I saw. I saw that you messed up his life, but he messed up your akhirah, your hereafter. Okay. Uh, you Sheikh took away his life, but he's going to mess up your akhirah, your sure. hereafter. Yes. Okay, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we've got a phone call from Nigeria, so let's take this and then we will come back to the discussion. We have with us uh, Sheikh Abu Bakr from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Walaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. How are you doing today? Alhamdulillah, I'm doing very, very well. Alhamdulillah, and you? Uh, very well. It's good to speak to you again. Uh, it's been some time. Uh, but unfortunately, the topic for today is not one of celebration like it was last time. But we are talking about yeah. the sad story of Syria. Sheikh, what words would you express about this situation? Wallahi. سبحان الله فإنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون الله معجرنا في مصيبتنا وأخلفنا خير منها. It is really a sad thing for us here in Nigeria and all across the world, the entire Muslim world, seeing what is happening in Syria. We ask that may Allah سبحانه وتعالى grant them ease for the shuhada from amongst them. May Allah grant them jannah. And for those who are living, this is a test for them, as it is a test for us as well. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make them steadfast and make them pass this test. Um, surely I have been listening to the speaker, and I must say to him, Jazakallah khair, may Allah increase him in health and in taqwa. Uh, all that he has said regarding the reality of the one who takes the life of another. Uh, similar to the narration of what we find in the Quran, of what happened between the sons of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, Qabil and Habil, uh, where the other one threatened to kill his brother, and he said to him, you know, he wouldn't retaliate, for verily, um, I hope or I wish that you will, ca you will carry my burden and your burden as well. Um, ismik, you will carry my sin or my burden and carry your burden as well. Uh, so there is a burden to be carried by those who are the aggressors uh, upon those who are being oppressed today, uh, but really it's a sad thing. Uh, my heart is uh, filled with sadness. Uh, the tears roll so many times when we see the images. At some point, I have to stop even looking at these images because um, I almost feel I feel helpless, and I feel the only thing I can do is to make du'a for them uh, and to ask that may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala grant them ease uh, and grant them uh, a, a lofty reward for you know enduring such kind of hardship uh, in this world as well. 
Okay, and uh, Sheikh, my final question uh, to you would be, if the people of Syria are, are watching this particular program, what message would yourself and the Nigerians like to give uh, to the people of Syria? The message I want to give to them, in fact, this is a message I give to every Syrian. SubhanAllah, anywhere I go to and I, I meet a Syrian brother, I give him a hug and I tell him, Wallahi, I love you for the sake of Allah. So what I'm sending to them from Nigeria, and this is all across the world, all the Muslim, um, the Muslims all across the world who are seeing this and who know that they, they feel they want to do something but they can't and they, their hands are tied or they are, um, they are one way or the other restricted to just making this sincere dua and plea to Allah on their behalf. I want them to know that we are with them, that we love them for the sake of Allah and that what they are facing in this world is a test, this is a trial, and they will, they will receive a lofty reward uh, in the sight of Allah, a lofty position, a, a lofty place in Jannah for their patience and perseverance. The Syrian people are the most beautiful people I have met, subhanAllah. Um, they are here in Nigeria. There's a very wonderful Syrian community in Nigeria, and I'm close to quite a number of them, subhanAllah. And um, I, I know that this, this trial they are facing it will come to an end one day. After every difficulty, there surely will come ease. Um, and so may Allah bless them and they should keep their, their hope and their, they should not lose hope and not despair in the mercy of Allah coming to them, inshallah. Okay, thank you very much, Sheikh Abu Bakr. All the way from Nigeria, we appreciate your wise words and for also you taking time out and helping us here on the channel. Thank you very much, uh, Sheikh. Let's get back to our discussion talking uh, about Syria. I want to ask a question. When we as Muslims see these images and see what is going on and understand this, we feel pain, we feel sorrow. Now, this pain that we feel, uh, is this part of Iman? Uh, is this one's belief being manifested? Absolutely. Um, it's injustice um, that is happening in, in the face of this earth. And, uh, you know, when we see injustice, this is evil, um, you should react. And if your heart doesn't react, if you don't have that rage and that anger uh, inside you, that means there is something wrong with your faith, with your iman. And you really have to go and, and, and check uh, where you stand uh, sure. on uh, once it comes to believing in Allah subhanahu because this is another Muslim you know they, they, this is another uh, even even non-Muslims who are being killed unjustly uh, is also to be addressed by Muslims it's an injustice to be addressed by Muslims so this is a normal course of action for every Muslim uh, that you're raised by this okay. and it's a sign of faith absolutely Okay, uh, Sheikh, uh, as we've been inviting people to join us on Facebook and to give comments on this subject, um, I would like to read out some of the comments we have on Facebook and then you can uh, give me your thoughts and feedback on that as well. Um, if I can start with the very first comment, and they hopefully will be appearing on the screen as well so we can read them together. The very first comment comes from uh, a young man by the name of Wim uh, Detame. And he says, I don't think you should talk about Muslim brothers and sisters. This fight is not about religion. All people in Aleppo should be saved. So keep informing the world about what is going on. Let Syrians in the West, together with their Western friends, go out and ask for action of the government. Or maybe the people should start boycotting Russian products, the weapon industry, and other things like that. What would you respond to? That's that also another way to deal with the situation. Uh, I mean, the... You, you see, uh, that's the beauty of, of, of hearing brothers and sisters like, you know, the, the, the brother you or the sister you, you, uh, you quoted their, sure. their comment. Uh, this is a good thing. You know, I think uh, boycotting Russian products uh, is one of the means to, you know, stop this. Speaking out against it, you okay. know, talking against it. Don't shy away. Uh, you see, they, they got us tricked in Syria with the ISIS. And, you know, the, the, so uh, now you, you got to be very careful because when you speak about Syria, you have to distinguish uh, between uh, uh, ISIS, which is, uh, you know, uh, a group or, you know, Allah knows best who uh, implanted them there and 
uh, they claim that they are doing the Islamic work. It's a bit uh, convenient, isn't it? We find them in all the right places at the right time. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's 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 you know it's it's uh, it's a scheme, like I said. It's Conspiracy. It's it's, it's a cons uh, you know uh, uh, you know it's it's obvious. Mm. It's crystal clear. Uh, you know who created them and how. Sure. They, so when you speak about this in, in the West, you have to be extremely careful. When I mean, you know, I live in the United States, sure. and when I talk about Syria and, and what's happening in Syria, I have to uh, because somehow they're going to take in you mistaken that you're supporting ISIS. No, I'm not supporting ISIS. I'm supporting the people uh, that actually the U.S. government is supporting, uh, the people who are trying to liberate Syria from the Assad regime. Sure. And they are being supported. So we can talk about this. So yes, talk about it if you're in the West. But be careful. Uh, make sure that you place that distinguishment between ISIS and the groups that are being supported by the uh, uh, Western uh, regimes. Excellent. Uh, Sheikh, let me read to you our second comment that we've got on Facebook. And that comes from uh, a brother by the name of Ak Ak Akasuki, if I if pronounced that correctly. And he says some of the solutions are uh, to unite for one dua uh, and ask Allah for his mercy and continually making dua. Number two, he said we should send help to those people who are suffering with basic needs like food and medicines. And number three, he makes a list of countries and he said all these countries must unite against terrorism and help each other uh, to support the people of Syria. So he's asking for uh, the Sunni Muslims to come together, these countries, their leaders to come together and to support the Syrians. So he's given us three solutions there. Well, he actually named the things that we, which is beautiful. Uh, I think that's the only thing that we have in our, you know, hand. Uh, there is nothing more, and this is really the painful piece of this. Is is there is nothing more that you can do beside this? Okay, very nice, yeah. uh, Sheikh. The third comment comes from Sister um, uh, Asma bint Zana, and she says, "La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah." May Allah subhanahu wa taala ease the suffering of these people and bring the victory Ameen. close. The only contribution I am capable of making is dua, which is the most important weapon for a believer. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ease their difficulties and grant them peace and stability Ameen. soon. I mean, what would you say to that? Don't ever underestimate the power of dua, dear sister. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. Uh, you cannot imagine that one dua can take care of the situation. Sure. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your dua and our dua for our Muslim brothers and sisters in, in Islam. Uh, I mentioned before that this is Qadarullah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam told us the only thing that can prevent the Qadar from being uh, basically implemented is the dua. La yaruddu al qada'a illa dua. So actually our dua can make things happen for our Muslim brothers and sisters in Syria, inshallah. Okay, sure. Sheikh, we have just like five minutes to go and I want to read out some more comments as well. Uh, we have somebody by the name of Sasko and he writes, my opinion is to fight back. We cannot just sit down and watch this Zionist killing our brothers and sisters anytime they want. This is my opinion. I feel ashamed when I see my Muslim brothers and sisters suffering like that. We are disappointed and our heroes are disappeared like those of Khalid bin Walid. You see, how are you going to do it? You know, it's, it's, it's just how you're going to go about it. You know, you got to be very careful because uh, Syria right now is uh, a fertile uh, land, uh, you know, uh, uh, for uh, everything to go either or, you know, uh, either either way. So you got to be really extreme. That type of language is, is beautiful. Uh, but be careful, dear brother, dear, uh, you know, whoever is writing sure. this comment, uh, where you are and, and uh, to whom are you addressing this? And... Uh, you know, it's be politically not correct. Be politically correct. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is a piece of advice sure. to, to the brother and sister in Islam. I, it's not as easy as it sounds. Sure. You know. Uh, Sheikh, the next comment comes from sister. Her name is Sabahat, and she says that all the Muslim countries should should speak out against the Zionist plot of the Middle East, and they should come together, unite, and speak against the common enemy, which is the Zionist. I think. Muslims just need to go back to their deen. Okay. Need to go back to Islam. Sure. Inshallah. Okay. I think this is the solution. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of the people who speak out may not even be praying five times a day. Sure. I think we need to start from there, inshallah. 
and hopefully enhance that. And, and, and uh, you, you see, that language is beautiful. Uh, when you have fulfilled uh, the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your lives, uh, when you're doing, you're striving to do your best. I think uh, uh, the focus here is how can we take Muslims back to their deen, to the religion of Islam. And with this, inshallah, Allah will uh, make a change in our lives. Okay, excellent, Sheikh. Um, we are at the end of the program. And uh, is there anything you would like to add or say to uh, console the hearts of those that are in pain, like the, the wider community, just in 10 seconds? The believer is always optimistic. Okay. Always, always optimistic because he believes that Allah is in control. Sure. And Allah will change things around in a second if he wills. But again, we need to go back to Allah sure. to qualify for Allah to change our condition. Inna Allah la yughayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never change the condition of an individual unless they change from within. And this is what we need to work on, inshallah. Okay. and stay optimistic. <coughs> All right, thank you very much, Sheikh, for Allah. coming to the program and giving us your contributions and uh, taking time out of your busy schedule as well. So thank you very much. Barakallah feek. Jazakallah khairan, Brother Junaid. Barakallah feek. And uh, I would like to conclude by saying assalamu alaikum. Wa alaykum assalamu wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you very much. Dear viewers, we've come to the end of our program here on Huda tonight, joining us live on this fantastic segment, this series that we are trying our very best to raise the awareness of the suffering of the people of Syria. And as we have just heard over the last few days, the Syrian, or I should say this militia, has bombed hospitals, killing innocent people, casualties of war. From amongst those, 92 of those are children. Residents from Aleppo are coming out and making statements that really, if you read into them, they'll make your eyes tear, they'll make your heart be faster. It's a very sad story. It's very catastrophic. And we need to take action. There are so many things that we can get involved in. Like the Sheikh mentioned, first and foremost is that of dua. Also boycotting. Also raising awareness using social media. Now, there are so many other things that we could do as well. And I'm not the most qualified person to tell you, but I'm sure you know. And I'm sure that you can join us on Facebook and other outlets and tell us what we can do as well to help the people of Syria. And I'd like to conclude by reminding you that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he made mention that the life of one human soul is worth more to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala than the Kaaba itself. So how much are you willing to go and spend and take time out to go visit the house of Allah and what you should do? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet are telling you that the life of one human being is more valuable than the Kaaba itself. So brothers and sisters, it's time to take action and it's time to stop being so passive about what is taking place around the world. I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in, especially those that contributed via phone and via Facebook. And hopefully tomorrow we will see you on our program as well on Hudud tonight with the same topic, with the same theme, but with different guests, inshallah ta'ala. So until then, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.